popular session in America. Actually, the Radiological Society of North America has invented such an interpretive session for the radiologists, particularly junior radiologists and postgraduates. The importance of this is, it is not a quiz. The result, whether right or wrong, should be rational. Ultimately, the moderator leads for the right diagnosis. But the interpreter is not supposed to give a single diagnosis. Slowly, first of all, in film interpretation session, the film is uh, projected and from the film you have to see what type of film it is. It is a conventional radiological film, a CT, MRI, ultrasound and then make the observations that are present, the two relevant observations, not relevant uh, things like uh, say cervical rib or uh, some other artifact and then having made the relevant observations you have to interpret them in pathological terms say for example if the radiolucent area is there in right upper zone you have to say cavity if there is a fluid level you can say cavity with a fluid level if there is a thick wall or thin wall like that you have to interpret in pathological terms and then finally give a differential diagnosis in the order of priority. Common things are common. So, first thing should be most common entity that you come across almost every day. And then rare entities. After all, in a film interpretation session, they won't give you the films that are diagnosed every day by a junior consultant or a junior radiologist. You have to think if you cannot make a diagnosis on a single film, then say which are the other procedures that you want to know. You want an ultrasound, a CT, a MRI, or a PET scan, depending upon the priority. Don't jump to a MRI or a PET scan. That's how the interpretation session goes on. Today, there are several cases where there is a brief history and then relevant uh, images are shown and one is supposed to make a final diagnosis. A 46 years old male, he presents with a non-productive cough and dyspnea, breathlessness for the past three months. There is no history of fever, no weight loss, no hemoptysis. The first thing that we do generally is a, take a conventional radiograph of the chest, a PA of the chest. And then while observing the important points, don't go to the diagnosis immediately, although it may strike you a classical diagnosis. Observe the findings. There are bilateral, patchy, homogeneous opacities scattered in both lungs. And then regarding the pleura, there is no pleural reaction. And then regarding the heart, heart is normal. About the hyla, they are just big. The hilum may be big because of the nodes, because of the dilated vessels, or because uh, something else is there, a mass in the hilum. So, you conclude in the film, uh, interpretative findings. Already you have observed there is no bone elision, no soft tissue changes. And so, patchy opacities, if you have to describe further, look at the right upper lobe homogeneous opacity. The outer border is in parallel with the thoracic cage. That is a significant finding. And then on the left side too, there are patchy opacities almost abutting the thoracic cage. In the hyla, there are no calcifications that you are going to see. And from this film alone, what can you see? If it is acute fever, you could have said the bronchopneumonia, something else. But if it is of some duration and some history is withheld, so we will ask for further examinations like CT. CT, high resolution CT shows there is a cavity 
an irregular outline cavity in the left lung. On the right side, again, please note that oblong opacity, the lateral border is parallel with the thoracic cage. And then several interstitial nodules and changes are noted. In the hyla, there is nothing specific. Further, almost similar changes in the rest of the lungs, but note interstitial changes are predominant in terms of nodules and some reticular changes. Another uh, view noting that there are thickened septae in the lungs, the pleura also are thickened. Ultimate diagnosis is pneumoconiosis. Can you jump to a pneumoconiosis without the giving the occupational history? If there is occupational history, of course, the plain film itself is classical and you could have made a spot bright diagnosis. But then with these changes, how can you come to a diagnosis of pneumoconiosis? That right upper lobe opacity, the convex border being parallel to the thoracic cage is quite important sign in radiology. That gives you a clue that it must be an occupational disease. For example, take silicosis. Silica is a fibrogenic and is mainly responsible for the collagen deposition in various uh, interstitial tissues. Conglomerate homogeneous opacities lead to progressive massive fibrosis. This is what the right upper lobe and left mid zone shows. Starts at the periphery is a smooth, sharp, elongated lateral border which parallels to the rib cage. That is what we said earlier. Of course, in classical silicotic uh, chest, you find eggshell type of calcifications in the hyla. And that cavitation is not necessarily because superimposed tuberculosis, but it could be ischemic necrosis in the center of the homogeneous opacity. That is what it is in this film. What is the differential diagnosis? Hylar prominence, patchy opacities, interstitial changes, sarcoidosis may be considered. And then anthracosilicosis, one of the occupational disorders. Malignancy, what type of malignancy in the lung? Maybe bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma, which is multicentric and produces alveolar opacities. Tuberculosis, today anything could be tuberculosis. In our student days, any picture could be syphilis, but today the picture has changed. Any pathology in the lung or elsewhere, first think of tuberculosis. But then the way it is going and the clinical symptoms do not suggest tuberculosis. Vaginous, vaginous granulomatosis, a possibility. But then again, going back to the homogeneous opacity and going back to the history and there are no changes in the upper respiratory tract, then you know, this is, these change, but still you have to think these entities in your differential diagnosis. Now next case, 37 year olds female with breathlessness and this is the chest film that is conventional film that is presented. Again, there is a procedure in reviewing a chest film, but a film interpretation session, you don't waste time of the audience by describing the ribs are normal, the clavicles are normal, the spine is normal, domes of diaphragm are normal. These are basic things, but then straight away we go to lungs. Hylar nodes are enlarged, both on right side and left side. Peculiarly enough, there is a some calcific density in the right hilum, a small calcific density. That indicates either the patient had a granulomatous disease earlier treated or untreated, you can get a calcific density. Parenchymal changes, not so visible, but if you look carefully, there are some interstitial changes more pronounced in the left lower zone than in the right zone. Cardiac size is normal, no other significant abnormality. Again, going to CT, the hilar nodes are enlarged, few interstitial changes in the lower zones. Another section showing the enlarged hilar nodes. Also note the calcific density which you pointed out in the right hilar nodes. 
well seen in the close up view multiple calcific densities in the right alar nodes. Diagnosis is sarcoidosis. Why sarcoidosis? Enlarged hyalur nodes, few interstitial changes in the basis. Actually, there are five stages in the diagnosis of sarcoidosis in the disease process of the diag sarcoidosis. Stage zero, the patient may have clinical symptoms. The clinician may suspect sarcoidosis, but still, if you take a chest, it may be normal regular conventional chest. In this particular case, for example, if there is a normal chest and there is high suspicion of sarcoidosis, you do a radionuclide scan, gallium scan, that will be positive. Stage 1 is hilar nodes, it could be bilateral, symmetrical, it may include right paratracheal, actually they described earlier as 1 right paratracheal, 2 right hilum and 3 left hilum, 1, 2, 3 sign of enlarged lobulated nodes and stage 2 is hilar nodes and as though the hilar nodes are squeezing the process some interstitial infiltrates are noted in both lungs and then stage 3 the process of squeezing by the hilar nodes has disappeared so the, there are no nodes all you find is infiltrates in the lung both alveolar mostly interstitial and stage 4 is end stage lung namely chronic fibrosis, thickening of the interstitium, pleural thickening and sometimes bullet formation or even a, a cavity with a, an aspergillosis from this ball. These are all the end stage lung disease. In the management of any disorder in clinical medicine, a chest film is essential. Often our people forget the chest film but it gives you the a clue for the process. Sometimes it may be normal, but even then that is a negative finding to exclude certain disorders. So in the management of disorders from head to toe, a chest film is essential. Now investigations, what are the investigations? Say the patient has got some complaint in the lungs, breathlessness for example in this uh, female, plain films. In plain films also, if there is a pathology in the lungs, please take a lateral view instead of jumping to CT. Today, as I see in various hospitals here, the lateral film is forgotten. They think it is a waste. Now, lateral film gives a lot of information. Segmental anatomy, hilar nodes, vascular pathology, mediastinal pathology, whether it is in the anterior, middle or posterior, all these things you can get by taking a lateral view. And of course then CT, today we have got multi-detector CT, spiral CT and what not. Radionuclear scan and MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, sometimes angio, say the right helum is big, is it due to a vessel, pulmonary artery angiosa or post anartic dilatation, you need an angio. And then ultrasound, earlier they said the ribs will interfere in the interpretation that's why they, it was not popular. Today, the specified probes in between the ribs you can go and find out if there is a cavity, if there is a pleural mass, it is solid, cystic, all these things you can get by ultrasonography. And then comes the PET scan. PET scan only in the sense PET CT combination, for example. In the sense, supposing with a small micro focus of malignancy, lung carcinoma say 3 millimeters or 4 millimeters, which you can miss by brain film, CT and what not. PET scan identifies it. But then it doesn't say it is carcinoma and where exactly it is. Then CT, which segment, which subsegment is located, you will know. The anatomical localization. Now 30 year old male with the nasal obstruction and hemoptysis. This is the PAV of the chest. Mild scoliosis of the upper thoracic spine is noted. Most important finding is the thick walled cavity in the right upper zone with an air fluid level. In general, tuberculosis cavities are thin walled and associated infiltrates may be present. Here it is thick walled, but then the wall is not that uniform. 
but the patient is only young, so you don't think of a adenocarcinoma of the cavitation. Hemoptysis is there. And in the lateral view, you can identify it is in the superior segment of the right lower lobe. Again, thick wall, again, you know, uh, fluid level, but there are no enlarged nodes. This is classical of Wegener's granulomatosis. Why is it classical? It could be any biogenic abscess or, uh, as we said, unusual tuberculosis plus biogenic abscess or a fungal infection. But with the nasal obstruction, clinically, see, a radiologist should be a clinical radiologist. You just can't interpret the films and film findings. You can't forget the patient. The patient is the most important. That's how we can help the clinician or surgeon about the diagnosis. A 40 year old man with history of pain in the right chest. Again, you see a cavity in the right uh, lower zone, thick wall, air fluid level. And then you don't see the right costophrenic angle. There may be poor effusion. And you can't even identify the right dome of the diaphragm. These three are main findings, namely a thick wall cavity in the right lower zone, obliteration of the right uh, costophrenic angle, and elevation of the right dome of the diaphragm. There is no atelectasis or fibrosis to consider or to be the cause of elevation of the right dome of the diaphragm. Lateral view, it is located anteriorly. And then still there is an air fluid level. There is right uh, transverse pressure is thickened. Again, the right dome of the diaphragm is not identified in the anterior portion. These things should click that maybe there is something subdiaphragmatic extending to the pleura and the lung. That is hepatopulmonary amoebiasis. Today, with ultrasound and uh, anti amoebicate drugs, we don't see much. But earlier, 30, 40 years ago, at Osmani General Hospital, we used to see almost every other day some sort of a manifestation of amoebiasis either in the liver, pleura, lung. 32 year old person complains of pain in the back. A routine chest view is taken because the pain in the back is in the upper back, not in the lower back. It's not in the cervical spine, but upper thoracic region. And again, if you look carefully, there is mild levoscoliosis in the upper thoracic spine. And if you look at the ribs, the left third and fourth ribs are separated. In fact, third rib shows erosion. That And further, if you look, there is a slight homogeneous mass along the superior to the aortic knob along the paravertebrate. So, combining all these findings, namely a mass, it of course is not as dense as you expect in a mediastinal mass, but still there is a density. And then separating the ribs, eroding the ribs, generally you think of a neurogenic tumor. Again, a penetrative view shows the scoliosis, the cause of scoliosis is the third thoracic vertebra on the right side is compressed or any type of vertebrae because the pedicle also is not seen that well. That is all you see in the penetrative view of the thoracic spine. And MRI, you see the lucency and signal intensity is much less in that the same para vertebral shadow which we saw in the view. That means it is cystic. It is not a solid neurofibroma, nor a neuroblastoma, nor a ganglion neuroma. Occasionally, you may get a cystic type of uh, neuroblastoma ganglion neuroma, but it is not common. There are no calcifications also. Again, in the sagittal view, MRI, you see the signal intensity is more. This indicates that it may just be a cystic lesion. And then correlated with the conventional radiology films, we identified it must be in the posterior mediastinum, cystic with a vertebral anomaly, lateral thoracic meningocele. 
e mare mai lo gram. You could see the connection, a dumbbell shaped connection from the subarachnoid space of the main canal and uh, this earlier identified cystic lesion, lateral thoracic meningocele in the case of neurofibromatosis. And then not satisfied with this, they have done a regular myelogram also. Again, it shows a diverticulum like thing arising from the spinal subarachnoid space. Similarly, confirmed lateral thoracic meningocele. Always is the cell phone is so common today and common sense should be present in most of the radiologists. So common things are common. If you have any problem, consult the partner. He will give you the diagnosis. 15 year old boy complains of deformed toes. These are the both feet. Look at the right uh, foot and left foot. Almost symmetrical bilateral shortening of the phalanges of the great toes. And the first metatarsals, the heads are deviated towards the midline. Are there any other uh, changes? Not many, but if you look carefully, there is a calcification between the first and second metatarsals. Again, it is bilateral and symmetrical. He also complains of soft tissue swellings over the chest. Bands of calcification and ossification in the soft tissues. Of course, the soft tissues are superimposed over the lung. So it looks as if they are in the lung, but they are all in the soft tissues, in the pectoral muscles. To take, by this time, the radiologist should make a diagnosis and he is looking for further evidence. Look at the thumbs. Again, calcification is there, sharpness of the proximal phalanges with widening. Neck, strap muscles. Ligament of nuke is calcified and ossified. In the abdomen, abdominal wall muscles, in the pelvis, several muscular calcifications are present. So the diagnosis must be earlier we used to call it myositis ossificans progressiva. Since the, actually there is no myosis inflammation, it is not only muscles but uh, ligaments and others, ligament of nuke is ossified, you have seen, and not necessarily ossification. Today's term is fibrodysplasia calcificans congenita. That is the proper term. Also called myositis ossificans progressiva, as I have mentioned, is a hereditary disorder characterized by symmetric congenital anomalies of great toes and thumbs. So from the, if you take an x-ray of the hand or a Foot, we may be able to make a fantastic diagnosis of fibrodysplasia calcificans congenita. Progressive chondrogenesis and heterotopic ossification of striated muscles, tendons, ligaments, fascia, epineurosis, and rarely even the skin. It is an autosomal dominant disorder. This is from the internet. You see multiple ossific densities clinically and in the skeleton of the muscles. And what should be the differential diagnosis? Metastatic calcification, they say there is a hypercalcemia, the hyperphosphatemia, and if the product is more than 70-75, soft tissues may calcify. Calcinosis universalis, idiopathic cause. Dermatomyositis is restricted only to the muscles, but you don't get deformities of the toes. Deformities of the toes and thumbs indicates that it must be the process must have started in the intrauterine process. That's why it's long standing. It doesn't allow the phalanges to grow. Tumoral calcification, but usually they are lumpy adjacent to the joints, either shoulders or hips or knees. And occasionally you may find a fluid fluid level if you take in the standing position. And of course, already I have mentioned disorders of metabolism. Serial